All right, go ahead and kick this off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. It's IoT at the Edge. This is a webinar about, webinar about uh, how you can drive your business forward by evaluating the true cost of ownership. My name is Chris Longo. I am an innovations expert with AOPEN. Uh, I've actually had over 20 years uh, working this type of solution. Most of my time spent with Google and also LG Mobile prior to that. Um, we're actually going to cover a few housekeeping items just before we get started. So at any point, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, go ahead and make sure you use the chat function uh, to all panelists. At the end, we're going to have a Q&A session of the presentation and we'll get to all your questions. Also, I wanted to point out that this is an on-demand recording, and we will also send out a copy of the slide deck following. So we'll be able to send the link to the recording and the slide deck for you to share with anybody that you would like to, uh, the second it's available. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Miles Schofield. Thanks, Chris. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me. My name is Miles Schofield. I'm an applications engineer for A Open America, and uh, let's get started today. So what we're going to be talking about in today's webinar um, is basically uh, what comprises IoT systems, modern IoT systems. Uh, this webinar could also be about edge computing and the challenges. It's sort of a general discussion about um, the systems technology and the future of the technology, where it is, uh, where it's going. Uh, and where the costs come from uh, in these types of solutions and what uh, companies are doing to try and combat that, those costs and uh, take advantage of opportunities uh, in those certain gaps, right? So uh, the main one, the main concept is of course uh, price and, and the total con concept, uh, cost of ownership is really about if you have an application that will be running for an extended period of time, uh, on the IoT edge device, um, you know, uh, it, it involves these two primary costs, hardware costs and software costs, right? So hardware costs, obviously AOPEN is a, a, a hardware company, so we're, this presentation is mostly going to uh, focus on hardware costs, but I did want to mention some things in terms of software and system costs as well uh, that are interesting to the discussion. So hardware costs, uh, as you might uh, expect, just to frame it a little bit better, uh, is that, of course, when you have an edge solution, your initial hardware costs is, of course, a factor. You have, there's the installation costs, the maintenance costs, and then the refresh uh, replace costs. So if you're planning on installing something um, like a building monitor or a camera system, how long is it gonna be running for? What's the refresh rate? Um, and what is the actual timeline? How many times are you gonna have to refresh or place that hardware over the timeline of the entire project, right? Software costs, um, you're probably more familiar with is of course the system, uh, the endpoint management, if that's part of your solution, and then the primary application. And then also the main uh, conversation uh, around this type of technology is of course local remote costs, right? Uh, is how, many, how much resources do you actually need to place on the edge? Uh, you know, can you go, for your particular solution, can you just go and install 5,000 Raspberry Pis on your client's network, right? That's probably not something they're going to allow you to do, so you may need to plan on uh, using local processing power to process data, either uh, feeds or sensor data from those particular. So trying to figure out exactly how to manage and where uh, your cloud costs, your compute costs, and of course your hardware costs is what we're talking about today. So. Like I mentioned, let's talk about software first. Um, of course, the main uh, system costs when it comes to trade-offs is support and security. I'll go over that a little bit more. Um, so system costs, what I mean is sort of your OS, your, um, uh, your, your base uh, compute layer. Uh, in terms of endpoint management, uh, these are systems, um, you know, if you're not using uh, some sort of virtual machine or client machine, uh, those certainly count, but generally speaking, when you talk about endpoint management, it's something like uh, CEL or AirWatch or, or things like that. Um, and of course, the application costs, um, which in today's world is most likely a SaaS, uh, that's where everything passes are also available, uh, depending on how um, the solution provider is set up. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, the local remote costs. So it all depends on what type of, how much data you're getting, um, 
and where it's going and, and uh, all those things factor because there's obviously just uh, a million different types of IoT applications. So the main reason when you're talking about IoT edge solutions, uh, the reason why it's often confusing uh, is that it's extremely fragmented. Every single IoT solution provider I talk to effectively uses a different system in a, in a lot of cases. And it's because there's just no clear uh, winner that's going to fit every single situation, right? Um, you have systems like Chrome OS, which is very high security, but um, it's very low support in terms of peripherals and other types of, uh, you have to virtualize Windows applications and things like that. Um, and, but the other good thing is, of course, it has in-house in endpoint management available, which is extremely attractive. Uh, Linux, of course, is that everything, um, since, it, since it is open source, if you're looking to have an enterprise solution, you're entirely responsible for the security uh, and the endpoint management on the Linux device, unless you, your solution, you want to sort of go for a pass um, on the uh, security endpoint management on an existing uh, Linux, pro Linux product. So once again, after Windows, uh, most uh, companies will support Linux second. Um, Windows, of course, is the next one. That's sort of the gold standard. Uh, of course, every, everything supported by that first, high security, but uh, the, the main downside of Windows is that uh, in most general use cases, it's a bit bloated. Uh, and of course, it's expensive, right? Um, the next one, Android, of course, non-mobile. So Android is strictly a mobile platform, but a large uh, percentage of the market and IoT type devices do use uh, Android. For instance, lots of smart TVs use Android systems. Extremely low security and low support um, because a lot of the support is written around the concept that these should be mobile devices and your smart TV is not a mobile device. Um, so the main reason people use Android is that resources do exist around programming um, for, uh, for these devices. So uh, the libraries and software support is actually pretty good. It's just the fact that uh, you have to create extra systems to get it to run in a more IoT type fashion. Um, and of course, embedded is the last one um, where uh, embedded systems are sort of very, very niche OSs created by usually hardware manufacturers um, to, you know, basically run almost singular function of what the, the product is supposed to do, uh, do. And of course, once again, when you're working with an embedded system, uh, they usually only support exactly what they were designed to support. And of course, they're, they're usually low security because there's not the, the inherent overarching security framework. Uh, the one, uh, the image on the bottom is an open product called the D, uh, D3450. The reason I put it there when we're talking about systems is that this is a Windows or a Linux system, but um, one of the ways that hardware can affect um, these type of system markets in terms of what you choose uh, is through our features such as the dual LAN, right? The reason why dual LAN is important is because if you have a, an IoT solution where you do want to use lower security devices instead of, you know, if you have the option between using 50 Windows devices or one Windows device and then um, uh, 49 Android devices, you can actually use, uh, a, you know, the dual LAN, uh, one connects to the internet and then the second connects to the intranet and you can sort of use it as a mini firewall. Now, it's, it's very important in enterprise solutions because not every enterprise client is gonna let you into their server closet. So these sort of pseudo sort of security devices uh, have become a very, very large market um, in the coming year, uh, uh, a growing market just for that reason is because they basically uh, support the security for your individual application, uh, your IoT application that's deployed. So, all right, let's get into hardware costs. So, should be familiar, this is, this is all uh, common stuff. You know, the price of the hardware up front, installation costs. Uh, if you're less familiar with this, uh, I usually call it as a site survey with an install uh, quote. Uh, and, uh, and these things get way more expensive, the larger solutions. So if you're doing a, a video wall in a stadium or you know, two by two video walls in retail and things like that, and of course, uh, installation costs do increase and maintenance costs increase with specific knowledge. Um, so the, when you're buying, uh, working with hardware where the installation requires certain building codes and safety standards, that's gonna cost you more to maintain and fix and install. 
Of course, the major one we're talking about today uh, is hardware maintenance costs, right? Diagnosis, RMA, service uh, repair and replace. And of course, the refresh replace costs over um, the entire length or uh, use of the IoT application basically just duplicates all these costs again, right? So when you do a refresh replace, usually um, it's going to, if you do a, a full <laughs> refresh replace, you're going to have to eat all these costs once again. So the primary uh, concept to start out with today in terms of the total costs versus initial costs is that when it comes to hardware um, in general, the, the initial costs are fixed. Uh, and by that, I mean, you get what you pay for. There's no real way I can make an i7 any cheaper for you or anything like that. So the, the market is extremely crowded. You get what you pay for. Um, lots of options and price points. Uh, generic solutions, of course, dominate because the way that hardware design works is that uh, it's expensive to innovate, um, mainly from the fact that uh, coming up with new reference designs or new uh, thermal designs and all this sort of stuff it is very expensive and then you're going to have to risk uh, inducing uh, failures and risk into your system overall. So that's why there's just a million generic i5, i3, Celeron boxes out there is because uh, the designs are available uh, and the hardware costs are effectively fixed, right? So what are we really talking about in terms of the difference between hardware? And it's, and it's really uh, what you're trying to minimize, uh, since the hardware prices are generally the same, uh, is the maintenance cost, right? Uh, so SLA or maintenance cost, uh, these costs are extremely complicated to uh, calculate, right? Especially uh, if you don't have complete control over the entire system, right? As I mentioned, every situation is gonna be different. It's more complicated to um, you know, replace uh, uh, hanging video walls or, you know, the, uh, any sort of these more complicated um, systems which involve um, multiple types of systems, right? So let's say in a, a point of sale system, uh, uh, you're going to, you know, call one person for the software, one person for the hardware, one person for the networking, one person for the payment, right? And everything, uh, all those multiple support teams need to be um, considered when you're talking about the SLA contract. But in generally speaking, when we talk about the major limiting factor for IoT solutions is really um, the $350 per event truck roll cost, right? And that's the main thing uh, aside from your hardware refresh that is going to really uh, kill your TCO. So at AOPEN, what we really try and do is optimize to make sure that devices really fail uh, as little as possible because that $350, that's basically the price of a device. And if you're looking at a lower end device, um, like an Android device is going to be around $200, then a single trip uh, to go fix an Android device is often uh, not worth it uh, whatsoever. It's almost uh, twice the price of the device, which is uh, insane when you're just uh, looking at pure hardware prices. So what, generally speaking, the, the AOPEN is just trying to optimize to reduce the amount of any sort of truck roll or maintenance costs associated with hardware by reducing failure rate and increasing runtime. And that's, that's what we're really gonna be talking about today. So generally speaking, um, when we talk about TCO of hardware uh, for AOPEN devices, it's about 15, 50% less than commercial competitors. And the way that you can calculate that, just ge generally speaking, is that um, AOPEN devices are going to last three times longer than any sort of consumer device, and we'll talk about exactly why that is later. Um, and then, of course, it's going to fail 10 times less. So you're going to get 10 times the failures and three times the run rate for our devices. And if you're running a project over 10 years, you can see uh, that obviously you're going to be saving a ton of money. So let's, uh, let's dig into one more topic about um, what you can do on the hardware side to re reduce that truck roll cost. I just wanted to bring this up briefly. So one of the new technologies AOPEN is working on is a system called AICU. Um, which is a module which has a serial connection to a special uh, module inside our media player. Uh, and the main thing is that it supports out-of-band uh, management. So uh, why is out-of-band management it, uh, important? So out-of-band just means that if the device is completely powered down, uh, crashed, or hung, 
and the operating system is completely unresponsive, that's an out-of-band event. And so what this little box on the side does is that it has a network connection, its own power source, uh, and it can actually trigger a hard restart on the box. And if that can save you the $350 across your fleet of IoT devices, then it's definitely worth, worth it, you know, when you don't have to have your client or your client's IT guy try and get up on a ladder and try and restart these things. So um, this is just another, um, the, the, the future of these type of hardware systems is really gonna be these, these systems that really try and reduce um, the need to ever have to go and maintenance these things or restart them whatsoever. So uh, the rest of the information about AICU is of course, it's a cloud dashboard management system um, where you can go easily target your device with scalable rollouts. Um, and the other cool thing it does is allow you to easily um, configure a uh, hardware watchdog and power uh, settings directly into the BIOS from uh, the cloud dashboard, which is nice as well. So you don't have to write it yourself. So the main conversation when we talk about uh, hardware uh, TCO costs is that obviously everything's gonna be uh, different, right? If you're managing a single location with, you know, let's say 5,000 endpoints, um, then a lot of your, um, a lot of your TCO can, uh, costs can just be a person, right? If you have uh, IT people on site and they can literally just go uh, and, uh, and then swap out hardware if it fails and you can use massively inexpensive cheap hardware which will fail constantly if you have these people uh, uh, available. But the planning for failure, uh, although it is a strategy for things like data centers, which are very consolidated, is very difficult to do for uh, distributed networks, right? So this is a conversation that I have with clients all the time is, oh, well, I can just have, you know, Jerry go down and fix it. Well, you know, these people have salaries, right? So the trade-off in cost is, of course, is the IT professional salary versus uh, the ability to uh, just have the, de the devices not fail. So it, those are generally uh, very complicated to calculate and the, and they are mostly only affected in, uh, effective in localized sort of um, solutions. A good example, last thing I wanted to bring up about how complicated distributed networks are uh, and how that $350 truck roll cost really affects things is that um, generally speaking, as I mentioned in other webinars, you want distributed systems that are managed by the client itself, right? A cell phone I refer to as IoT device is perfect because you can just sit back and get your SaaS fee and they, if it breaks, they're gonna fix it themselves because they're the end user, right? But in terms of uh, distributed infrastructure like mesh networks or distributed power, those will always be uh, a failure until they can get to the point where you can avoid those personalized $350 visits every time there's a little hiccup, right? So, all right, so the, one of the other main points uh, that I wanted to get into um, now that we've talked about how hardware failures can affect TCO is of course why hardware fails. And uh, this I hope uh, uh, can everyone learn something from this section because this is definitely something that I learned about uh, since I joined AOPEN about four years ago. Uh, so no, the first one is, uh, as I mentioned, most of the hardware market is the same spec, right? i7 is i7, right? So why do devices fail at different rates if everything's an i7? Uh, and the second idea that comes up a lot is why can't you just make a Raspberry Pi 4, right? Um, which can run 4K and is about 35 bucks. We know all the components that go in there. So how come you can't just make that uh, you know, uh, the components must cost way less than $35. So why can't you just have it run for 10 years for $35? Uh, so the, <laughs> uh, the, the concept that oh, if the components work together, there must be a way for the components to last a long time. So why, why would you have something like a Raspberry Pi 4 that has certain failure modes um, because clearly the components work together in some uh, capacity, right? So these are the two primary uh, uh, misconceptions that I want to address about why hardware fails. So the first one is, of course, uh, system engineering. Um, so in general, hardware longevity is faith-based because, as I mentioned, every IoT solution is different and uh, every environment is going to be different. So uh, hardware manufacturers can go out there and say their products will last 20 or 30 years, but there's no way that any client could actually test that. Um, 
because they don't have the proper longevity testing equipment, right? Uh, hardware manufacturers have that. However, uh, however, most clients don't. So hardware is basically, when you buy it, you're trusting in the brand, which is why brand and hardware is so uh, important. Uh, and the reason why a lot of uh, our best customers at AOPEN are people who have just bought very generic hardware and it's failed on them at an extremely high rate and it's not and then it becomes extremely important for them to have a hardware provider that they can talk to work with uh, and of course a device that's not going to fail so one of the primary uh, answers to the last slide was although designs are standard corner, corner cutting is the hallmark of the industry so designs are very standard but if there's money to be made by cutting corners people will obviously do this so um, that's one of the main things that induces risk into the system is by using cheaper components, um, not doing any uh, testing, changing the design slightly to try and uh, make money or uh, save manufacturing costs. All that sort of stuff is, is very uh, extremely standard practice in the industry. And AOPEN combats that by just not cutting corners. It's a very simple idea, right? We just don't cut corners and uh, we do things properly when you use the right components. Uh, and but this should uh, illustrate the fact where um, uh, as to why there are mass hardware failures, right? So if you look at the you know a lot of the very public Samsung uh, failures from the past, the Note 7 battery issue and the Galaxy Tab issue, uh, if you just look at those at face value, you can say, well, why does this massive international corporation why would they release a device uh, with such a gross hardware failure? Uh, it doesn't make sense because it's a terrible PR move, right? And the bottom line is that when you're working on consumer devices, you don't have time to do component testing, system testing, and make sure. So every component in the Samsung Note 7 probably worked perfectly well together. Um, it was just the combination of the entire system uh, that caused the individual component, in this case, the battery to fail. And these type of uh, systematic failures for hardware can take their forever to fix. I just brought up the Honda since I have this issue with my Honda. It's, there's a dashboard light issue which affects 20 years of cars and is caused by a single resistor on the primary dash, uh, dashboard controller. And Honda couldn't fix it for 20 years, which is mind-blowing to a lot of people. But if you look at the cost of redesign and the how much it is to repair and blah, 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 all that stuff, it's, it's a much harder problem to solve. So the bottom, the bottom line is that uh, AOPEN has our advantage not only from doing things properly, but we do something called component level testing, uh, which is extremely key because that's the thing that makes sure um, that all the components are, will actually work uh, together properly uh, for the entire life of the device, right? So that's how you avoid issues like the Samsung uh, Note 7 or the Galaxy Tab issue and, uh, and other problems. So the second reason um, that systems fail is the right tool for the, what I like to call design or the right tool for the right job. Hardware fails because it's being used outside its original design intention, right? And you're trying to open up, uh, you know, a, a, a can with a fork, right? Or, you know, it, it's, uh, it's just you're, you're, you're not using uh, the product like it was designed. Most products are perfectly fine uh, if you use it exactly how it was designed. And so I'm gonna, the, the main thing I wanna clarify is how hardware systems are actually defined. And the main one is really the, the commercial grade. So lots of people say commercial or enterprise grade or whatever grade, um, it, it doesn't really matter. So the only thing that commercial grade really means uh, is that the device is designed uh, remember, we're talking about right tool for the right job. The device is designed to run 24 hours a day. So when I say you're using the device in an uh, incorrect fashion, is that you're taking a consumer device and you're running it for more than eight hours a day. That actually, now you can say, well, doesn't the design have grace period and I have a consumer laptop that I use 12 hours a day and it seems to run fine. Yeah, those sort of anecdotal in a bubble arguments, but you know, the, 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 the time that these issues really become apparent is when you're trying to grow your business and have a real scalable solution. And if you use the wrong hardware when you're scaling, then these, these type of issues will pop up 100% at scale, right? And so, so how commercial grade is actually defined is that the device can be actually run all day, right? This is where the, uh, the, the device running three times longer, because if you can only run a device eight hours a day, 
uh, in a commercial device, you can run th uh, effectively three times of that a day, then you can see you're going to get three times the use out of uh, the device over um, the particular uh, the period that you're running it, right? So commercial grade in terms of design intention uh, is, is, uh, is sort of a moniker, but the main time it comes to effect is, is that you can call something commercial grade, but it really requires a commercial grade warranty. And a all AOPEN devices come with a commercial grade warranty. So once again, if you use a consumer device and you run it uh, as an IoT solution, you run it all, it's gathering data all day, every day, then they don't have any warranty commitment to you because you're improperly using the device, right? So the most important thing AOPEN offers here is that they are commercial grade in the sense that they come with a commercial grade warranty, right? The second thing in terms of design is that the more pieces you introduce uh, from the more vendors, um, the more failure and risk that you're going to introduce in your system, right? Um, so to try and reduce the amount of um, changes or modifications or anything else that you would need in a particular system, uh, commercial features basically try and cover all those gaps um, for you. So some of the commercial features, of course, dual band Wi-Fi to make it more stable, uh, rugged housing and uh, shock proof and drop proof for better shipping, uh, IP54 for drink and spill, all these sort of things that um, uh, normal consumer devices do not do um, in commercial applica applications. So the main thing I say is that uh, commercial grade devices for commercial applications because you can see how a lot of these features just will save you a lot of headaches um, in, in your uh, in your type of IoT solution. The most important one by far though uh, and uh, our AOPEN's primary devices are our fanless devices and the, the main thing that fanless devices really do for you uh, in solid state is that they re remove the risk of um, the fact that you don't maintenance them exactly how they're supposed to be, which is a massive cost, right? If you choose to use a fan device, there's probably, you know, there's a schedule into when you need to go and get on that ladder and blow out the fan and if it's semi-outdoor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's very hard to predict um, and uh, plan for those type of costs, so most people don't, right, which is another reason why you see hardware failures, but uh, fanless and solid state devices just remove that risk 100%. Uh, 100%. So the, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of um, device and failure rates is, and spec sheets is that one thing that you see on spec sheets a lot in the hardware industry is MTBF, which is sort of a terrible, uh, uh, it's a very, <laughs> misleading idea. So there's MTBF, MTTR, and MTTF. So mean time to repair and mean time to failure. And once again, uh, the reason why there's so many terms is because you're trying to uh, use these different um, numbers to try and collate the device's performance over a certain time period. So the main thing that you we look at in terms of IoT devices um, is mean, what, what is actually mean time to failure because after you install a system, you wanna know how long it's gonna run for before you have to potentially do a refresh on a meaningful population of your devices, right? But people use MTBF um, just because it's a more commonly used uh, computer phrase. Um, so in general, it's, it's not the most straightforward and, and, and useful metric that hardware um, providers use. So the main thing I wanted to point out about uh, the difference between AOPEN failures and, and typical um, uh, manufacturer failures is that if you look at a regular failure curve, you can see that the um, what your experience failure rate on a normal product is going to be the blue line, which is sort of consistent, right? Uh, that would um, that would imply that when you deal with an IoT system, that you should for three years, uh, your failure rate across those three years would be relatively the same across. But that's just not um, that's just not true. Uh, for AOPEN products. So the way that AOPEN products get our failure rate down so low is because we do extra QA steps to basically el completely eliminate the early infant mortality rate, or as a lot of people say, the DOA rate, um, where you take something out of the box and it just doesn't work and your installer hopefully has a spare. Um, and so you can see if you get rid of all the red, then the main thing that you're just working on um, with AOPEN devices, it's really just the yellow line and our random failures are extremely low as well because of, like I said, the component testing and the extra work that we um, put into reducing those type of um, uh, uh, 
manufacturing defects and system failures. So, so when we talk about a open products, uh, our real strength here is that um, you're going to get a, a device that fills uh, less than two two uh, two percent for the first year, um, which is about ten times less. So the best consumer product on the market is going to fail at about twenty percent, right? And it's because they have to deal with um, DOAs and things like that and out of box failures. And the reason why they have to do with that is because they're trying to increase their margin and not test systems after manufacturing them. So the last thing that uh, AOPEN really offers, actually there's a few more things, but uh, the, the, the next thing uh, to think about when you're choosing a hardware partner is uh, really uh, making the product available. So a lot of IoT solutions, uh, when you talk to SaaS providers, they all want to be completely platform agnostic. But the issue is, is that platforms are essentially di uh, different, right? Everyone wants to basically have their user use a cell phone uh, because people will fix cell phones and if the, the software doesn't work, they'll try and figure out ways, they'll report the bugs themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But in an actual situation where it costs you $350 or X amount of dollars to maintenance, uh, an IoT solution, you want to have it on the exact same system and have the largest population because every new system that you have verifies risk. Because although they may be running the same version of Linux or Windows, they, they're, there's always going to be slight differences between the iPhone 3, 4, 5, X. There's always slight differences which are going to cause uh, difference. Uh, 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 induce risk and failures into your system. So what AOPEN does is we follow the, um, the, the Intel extended uh, roadmap uh, so we can offer our products for a very long time, which means that as you deploy an IoT solution, you're gonna become, uh, be much more likely to be able to roll it out on exactly the same platform across your entire distributed network. Um, and the last thing, of course, to uh, uh, mention in this particular category is hardware failures can give uh, customers an excuse to change platform. So if you are a SaaS, right, uh, especially for an IoT type of solution, you want to reduce the risk, uh, the refresh cycle, because let's say you deploy it on very cheap hardware and that breaks after, uh, expectedly after one or two years, then the customer knows that they're going to have to eat all those upfront costs again, so they can also evaluate changing software uh, platforms at that time as well. So having more stable, uh, long-lasting hardware gives um, the customer less opportunity to change their mind about their infrastructure. So uh, one of our major um, business types at uh, AOPEN America is the OEM ODM partnership. Uh, the primary value uh, that we add here in the American market is that we, uh, we basically focus on making this high quality hardware uh, which reduces those TCO costs and more importantly allows people uh, to see, succeed in scaling their business not only across co uh, countries but uh, you know across sites as well. Like I said one of the most uh, uh, critical things is that if you have an IoT solution that's scaling and your network starts to get extremely large then supporting that network and not having massive failures will really cripple your business and I've seen tons of businesses even with my short time at AOPEN just completely fail uh, to scale right they'll get a POC with a major partner and then they can't do it because they just don't have the support infrastructure to actually succeed and the way AOPEN uh, supports this is by um, our partnership with of course uh, Acer and we can really um, make customized products, semi-customized products, uh, to make sure that our partners uh, get exactly what they need. So we try and cover um, most of the high end, where Acer, of course, is a consumer brand. So we're, we're uh, trying to cover applications like IoT, IPC, any sort of these kiosks, outdoor kiosks, any sort of these heavier IoT applications um, that really uh, require some uh, semi uh, uh, custom um, customization of the devices. So one of our key partners um, for this type of business in the United States um, is the company Volta. Uh, and so today we're going to have just a quick um, chat <coughs> um, with, an, I believe it's an engineer from Volta, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about how uh, to choose hardware, compute, IoT compute hardware uh, inside the device um, and just go a little over about um, uh, what they do and the technical challenges associated with rolling out a nationwide uh, outdoor kiosk network. So, are you there? 
Hey, yep, this is Caleb here, yep. and I think there's one other joining me as well. Okay, perfect. Jason here as well. Thanks, Jason. So we have Jason and Caleb from Volta. So first off, guys, uh, just tell me a little bit about, uh, I know I just mentioned it a little bit, about what Volta, uh, Volta does in terms of why, why is there kiosks, what the business plan is, all that sort of stuff. Sure, so um, I'll take this one. I'm Caleb. I'm a senior software architect at Volta. Been at the company for about three and a half years, though the company itself is about 10 years old and its mission to convert as many gas powered miles to electric miles as possible. So in short, we're just trying to kill a shell basically, but the way we're doing that is by trying to build the world's largest free electric car charging network. And you didn't mishear me, I did say free. Uh, so our whole shtick is that we put screens on our chargers uh, which run ads and the ads pay for the electricity. So we're primarily putting these in front of malls and grocery stores, places that are really high foot traffic, um, places that we guess get a lot of drivers, but then also just a lot of eyeballs in general to drive up the value of the ad real estate. But at the end of the day, it is the charging station itself, which got our station installed there. And we now have over a thousand stations spread out across the US. Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, so today we're focused on the hardware, but of course these guys are experts. As you just heard, their entire model is based off of effectively an ad network and they're extremely knowledgeable at uh, digital out of home. So if we have a uh, another webinar focusing on people who are really succeeding in digital out of home, I, I might ask you guys back uh, to get you <laughs> get more feedback on optimizing ad space and uh, ad value in terms of kiosk positioning. But today we're talking about um, the challenges with uh, deploying a uh, extremely large nationwide uh, network of kiosks. So the kiosks are in everywhere from Chicago to Arizona. So what what sort of challenges did that sort of bring up? Yeah, that's a good question, Miles. There's definitely been a lot of variation in the environment that we're deployed in. I even think back to the first stations that were ever constructed and installed in Hawaii, which is also a very salty environment. There's a ton of stations, especially in California, that are right by the ocean side, but the probably most challenging ones are in Arizona, where in the summer the temperature can get to you know, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, or in Chicago, or in the winters they can get down to below 20. And of course, these are uh, these are stations that need to be on delivering a charge and also delivering advertisements. Uh, like every single hour of the day. Uh, so yeah, those have been some very interesting environmental challenges for us, especially because these chargers are big metal boxes. So not super great in terms of you know, the environment inside of the station as well. So we've uh, been deploying them in harsh environments, but also deploying an even harsher environment, if you will, for the components that we're needing to deliver in order to enable both this charging and advertising infrastructure. So, um, so now once you saw these challenges, and I'm sure you ran lots of POCs and testing and things like that. So, um, what I thought was interesting after I think we talked last year one time was really uh, the failure, the initial failure modes, and what you were um, in terms of the fact that devices were uh, failing more on the cool end, like you were seeing a lot of failures in Chicago. And so, in terms of the what it, what happens in the kiosk in terms of uh, you know, why didn't you put a heater in there or uh, a huge NEMA box or et cetera, et cetera. So what, what were some of the options you considered um, when trying to accommodate um, for these type of weather conditions? Uh, yeah, I can cover this, Caleb, if you want. Um, so as Caleb mentioned, you know, ambient temperature extremes, um, we ended up actually using, I guess it's a NEMA box, but an environmental enclosure that would ensure kind of a, a normal operating temperature. Um, I suppose that answers your question. Yeah, and I can add on to that a bit yeah, yeah. by mentioning that uh, there was, uh, yeah, essentially, uh, we were deploying much cheaper computers at that point. Uh, so mm. we weren't working with AOPEN quite yet. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so we were basically figuring out like, okay, how can we drop uh, some compute off in these environments? And as Jason has pointed out, we, we had an enclosure that was essentially custom built because of the rather proprietary form factor of the station itself. Doesn't leave a huge amount of space for us to throw components in there. So this ended up being a pretty costly part of our bomb. In fact, I, I think the container itself was on the order of three times as expensive as the actual computer that we were deploying. So it was a pretty hefty price tag to just enable these things to run. 
uh, which is why ultimately we decided this was a great way of getting our foot in the door, but we definitely had to rethink any type of environmental enclosure if we wanted to deploy these stations at scale. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a really interesting point, the fact that you're always going to have multiple options uh, available to you. Like I mentioned, you can use uh, extremely cheap hardware, but you have to have guys around uh, to be able to run over and maintenance it constantly. So was that a consideration in terms of uh, hardware choices, in terms of how often you can actually have these things maintenance and, and go and dust it out and, and swap? Yeah, I would say uh, that was a huge consideration, right? Like, as Caleb mentioned, we were using um, substandard computers originally, um, and yeah, that was definitely a deciding factor in you know, choosing a open devices, um, a bit more ruggedized, and can handle those more extreme you know, conditions. So, um, so what happened next was. Uh, um, was basically uh, Volta was looking for a specific uh, type of hardware that isn't very available on the market uh, to meet these specific challenges, right? We're talking about trying to avoid using a customized NEMA box and specialized environmental controls. And so uh, one of the primary values uh, that AOPEN brought was they brought these new requirements to us and we were able to change one of our stock devices, the DEX 5550. Uh, we put a much larger heat sink on it and we also put a GPIO port on there. So we did, once again, um, we brought up, uh, we were able to quote unquote semi-customize one of our regular devices uh, to make it much more, um, uh, uh, much closer and much more uh, aligned uh, with the, the Volta use case, that outdoor kiosk, wide temperature uh, range, completely fanless, uh, um, a, a maintenance-free device. Uh, and, and you just heard them say how important all those aspects uh, are in terms of saving money in these types of uh, solutions. So in terms of that extended temperature range, I think that's pretty uh, clear. Um, but what, what were some of the reasons for uh, the GPI, uh, GPIO part? Sure. Um, so yeah, I, what hasn't been mentioned yet is basically just raw compute power. Um, that gives us more more of that, we run services that are pretty CPU intensive. Um, we do camera recognition and, and detection locally, so that obviously takes some compute. Um, so that was one of the considerations. And then as far as the GPIO devices go, um, we're adding sensors to our stations to better support some user experience, um, controlling lights, um, and then also uh, just temperature sensors and other things that we can potentially used to deliver information on our screen to people walking by, for example. Um, and the internal GPI, uh, GPIO device allows us to do this without, you know, adding another component that may or may not be ruggedized to handle kind of these extremes that we, we live in, or that these computers live in. Um, so that was another big reason. Um, and then just being able to kind of swap swap our old computers out with these new ones. Um, the hardware interfaces are consistent and we can even literally use the same machine image we use on your 3450s with the, the 5550s with very little, you know, um, exceptions um, or making exceptions for this new piece of hardware, so. Great, um, yeah, the, so the, that's really interesting. And the one thing that you brought up uh, was of course uh, the fact that you uh, are you're running two screens on this particular device, right? You're doing two 1080p uh, screens. That's correct. Yeah. So, uh, did you ever consider uh, uh, versions where you wanted to go with more boxes, or 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 uh, was that ever a consideration trying to do a one to one or a much cheaper type of device or, or anything like that? Um, Caleb, maybe able to answer that a little better. I know that we are now in a situation where we're using a media partner that requires us to target individual screens and we're able to do that from one device within within the great just within the station. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can mention one historical uh, piece of evidence there as well that we actually used to have two computers in our stations. Um, but that is of course an additional point of, of failure. Um, and I guess the, the one benefit there is that, you know, if a computer does fail, only one screen goes down. Um, but in general, that's increasing the overall footprint of components required. That's increasing the bomb as well. So uh, there is a certain point where 
you know, consolidating compute makes a lot of sense for us. As Jason pointed out, we're doing some rather interesting things on these CPUs, but simply running a 1080p display is pretty easy for these machines. So yeah. to, uh, to have it run both screens as well as the other things that we need was uh, certainly didn't feel like we were taxing it. Uh, at least we haven't, we haven't hit that threshold quite yet where we are running out of compute. Uh, so it, it seemed to be something that these machines could handle easily, which is why we were happy to consolidate to one device. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very tough challenge because you are doing something very uh, uh, the, the, uh, mission critical because you obviously don't want an advertising kiosk with a, a screen off. Uh, however, you know, typical uh, uh, solutions that may work around that are, are all those sort of daisy chaining or trying to support multiple screens on the same device. So as one screen goes down, the other device picks it up and things like that. But um, generally speaking, what, uh, what Volta did with this particular product uh, is, is the most straightforward. You buy a really high quality device um, that's pretty much just designed for exactly what you're doing. Uh, and, um, and it's able to meet all those requirements and, and successfully uh, have that low failure rate in this very challenging application. So uh, anything else on your mind, guys, in terms of uh, what you wanted to bring up today? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's one other thing that I think is just worth calling out again, since it, it's pretty incredible in my mind that we have replaced uh, essentially like two computers uh, of lesser quality, of course, uh, notably, and uh, an environmental enclosure with one higher quality compute device that actually decreased our overall costs, which I, I think is pretty uh, pretty remarkable uh, considering we're, we're definitely, I think, much happier from you know, a development team standpoint where we're able to do more of what we want, but at the same team, at the same time, our, uh, you know, our, our leadership is also ecstatic that we've decreased the, the cost of the station overall. So it's uh, pretty much a win-win for us there. Yeah, I'd also like to just, just add in terms of our partnership with you has been pretty amazing. Um, you guys have been very accommodating and very easy to work with and very responsive. And just wanted to share my appreciation for that. Thanks. I, uh, I definitely appreciate it. Um, you too. Thanks again so much uh, for joining the call. Um, and so um, I think we're about to uh, wrap up this webinar. So, um, so I'm going to just finish off with the last uh, few slides. Uh, you guys can hang out if there's any questions um, for you. We'll, um, maybe I'll involve you in a few of those, but I don't know yet. So uh, let's just finish off this webinar. Um, so the, the main, uh, to just put a cap on the, the, the voltage charging use case, is, is that it's really about, for AOPEN in particular, just as they just mentioned, it's about a, a hardware partnership effectively, right? Uh, it's about working together uh, to try and solve uh, this problem, which has many types of solutions. As I mentioned, it could be multiple devices, daisy chain devices, all this sort of stuff. Um, but you could see that uh, uh, the Volta engineers brought up the key challenges in terms of one system versus two system, uh, maintenance time, maintenance availability, uh, risk of a screen going down, and it's, and it's those type of partnerships uh, and technical challenges that um, we're trying to promote uh, and solve as AOPEN. So uh, we did do a use case on this a few years ago, and uh, it just highlights exactly what I just said. Uh, it's about that semi-custom uh, uh, um, semi -custom robust product line, uh, really tr being able to um, change a product to meet a customer's needs and working with them, right? We're just not putting things on a, shelves, a shelf for our products, uh, our partners to buy. We, we, we're addressing their individual uh, needs and use cases to, uh, directly. So when we talk about hardware, it's really more of a hardware partnership uh, with a lot of our uh, solution providers. So uh, to wrap this webinar up, before I hand it over, back over to Chris, um, with component, uh, the main three points uh, that we covered today is, of course, it's all about that system engineering, right? Doing things right um, all the way down to the component level to avoid not only the, those initial failures, but those random failures over time, and then the, the system uh, compatibility over the entire length of the life of the device. So that's how AOPEN ins really ensures that, that our two key selling points which save you money, which is that longevity and low fail rate. Um, second one is, of course, right tool for the right job, commercial devices for commercial applications. Uh, you know, you saw that huge list of special features and, you know, buying solid state fanless devices um, that don't fail is extremely crucial to uh, edge IoT device uh, just because of how ridiculously expensive, 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 excuse me, it is to uh, support a distributed 
um, computing network, right? It's much different than supporting a, a, a building with a few thousand devices uh, uh, than, than it is to support a network, a nationwide network of a thousand uh, charging stations, right? Uh, and of course, the last one is that uh, our partnership business, right? Working with um, partners uh, like Volta and really trying to uh, optimize the hardware, semi customize it to exactly what they're trying to achieve uh, for that particular use case. All right, uh, Chris, you wanna, you wanna, I'll flip it back over to you. Uh, thank you uh, once again to the Volta engineers, uh, Caleb and Jason, sorry if I get your name wrong. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Chris, you wanna jump on? Do we have any questions and you wanna wrap things up? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thanks again, Caleb, Jason. Really appreciate your time and thank you, Miles. Uh, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat here where we just cover the last bit of information. Uh, we are running low on time. So if questions do come in and we're not able to get to them, you can always email info at aopen.com and we'll be sure to have somebody reach out to you right away. Uh, just a few additional things while we're waiting for those questions to come in uh, that we wanted to cover is, uh, as Miles said, AOPEN has a vast product line. We can play pretty much in any, any space um, where our partners need a solution, and we have the ability to turn around and help engineer a solution from either what we have or if we need to build something, we have that full capability. Um, for instance, we have our full line of 10, 15, 22 all-in-ones. Um, on our Chrome side of devices that have been very popular for fast, easy deployments. Uh, same with manageability. We also have a new solution with everything that's going on nowadays, which is the AOPEN uh, heat finder. It's the thermal imaging solution, which is fast and accurate. Yes, there's a lot of solutions to market, but there isn't a lot of solutions that allow um, capturing data for the uh, temperatures and screening without forming major lines and slowing down your daily ability to get in and out of buildings. So we do have full information on solutions like that as well. Um, plus, as Miles said, our failure rates on our devices um, are all below 2% and our Chrome line is below 1% as well. So that's a very important aspect. So in some of the, the pieces, where you may not think to use us, but you really should, is if you have a project that you're looking to do, um, look at the Volta solution. Uh, they started just like everyone else with an idea. Well, that idea always expands. It doesn't just stay with one type of solution. Uh, it started off with, let's start with a charging station. And then it ended up, let's, let's pay for this by doing um, advertising and an ad network. And then let's start adding template sensors uh, or excuse me, temperature sensors and different pieces like that. So you need to look at the, the future scope of your project. And sometimes if you're so in depth with your project, um, it's easier just to have another set of eyes come in and say, hey, I see what you're doing. I love this. Did you know you could probably save money or um, group three of the different ideas you have into one solution? That's what we're here for. Um, so you can actually reach out to... Uh, Miles, me, or any one of our um, several engineering teams were scattered all over the world. We have the ability to be that second set of eyes where we can engineer a solution that's going to last and help with the future build of your project. So please keep a open in mind for that. We're not just building devices, we're building ideas and solutions. And we definitely want to be your go to for any ideas that you have. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap it up so we can uh, get people going. I just wanted to remind everybody that this uh, deck here, the presentation, uh, video recording will also be sent out. So please feel free to send that out to your uh, customers, partners, anyone you want, or if you want your own personal Chris or Miles attached to it, we're more than happy to jump on any calls. Um, to talk any solutions with any partners or projects that you may have. So don't be shy. Please feel free to reach out to us at the info at aopen.com and we'll be sure to jump in and help you as soon as we can. So thanks everyone for participating in today's webinar and we really hope to see you again next time.